Fabiola here from Germany and you are watching Teacher Learning Gas with Piri Herrera and Benjamin Stewart. Hello everyone and welcome to Teacher Learning Cast episode number three. This is uh, Benjamin Stewart in beautiful Aguascalientes in a place very uh, much familiar to me. Uh, it looks like my home. Hello, welcome everybody. Nice morning and uh, our third show and really glad to be part of this adventure event. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, this is our third show and uh, really getting started with new topics all related to education, teaching and learning, uh, our context. Uh, for those who are, have followed us who, who, or those who don't know us, uh, we, are, we teach in a BA program and uh, we are teaching uh, English language teachers. So we're, te we're teacher trainers and uh, each week, every Saturday morning, we get together and discuss different topics. Uh, you can get involved in the conversation. We're always looking for educators who want to come in and be part of the conversation. If you want to be part of the live broadcast, just reach out to us. Uh, we have a Facebook page. I think that would be the easiest if you're on Facebook. If you search Teacher Learning Cast, uh, you'll find a page where you can reach out to us and share ideas throughout the week. And again, as I mentioned, uh, uh, be a part of the live broadcast. We're always looking for uh, people to uh, participate and share experiences. Yes, and uh, sorry, but uh, I remember last week we were discussing several aspects about context and uh, we are trying to get into topics that are common for everybody at different educational levels and we are trying to uh, give opinions and get into readings about whatever we uh, find out may be interesting for you so please that's what we want to know uh, if you have don't have like really questions or comments right now you may have topics of interest in which uh, you want to us to to cover in the show, and we can invite also invite you to join us to come live with us on a Saturday morning, and uh, later on the video will be on demand for everybody. So share, please like like the page at Facebook, share it with everybody, and tell them well we are live mornings at, at eight fifteen Saturdays morning, and. Um, and then and later on demand you can watch it on so for today ben what do we have for today we got a great show here for you today uh we actually have a lot of things to talk about and part of uh, we'll go well, part of what we're going to talk about in fact we're going to start with the first segment is uh, learning networks and uh i there's some interesting uh things i wanted to talk about i'm going to go ahead and start sharing my uh screen here um I came across a piece that uh, discussed uh, cultivating and growing your personal learning network. And there's a couple of points here I wanted to share and, and see what you thought about some of these, uh, PD. And the, it, the piece really started out by asking the question, do you have a personal learning network? And I think it's important really to start uh, the discussion really to try to define first what a personal learning network might look like. And for the purposes of this discussion, when I think about a personal learning uh, network, I'm really thinking about three different interrelated aspects of, of a network. Uh, one being uh, the sharing of ideas, uh, opinions, and concepts. Number two, really the, the connections of different materials or technologies we use to communicate those ideas. And number three, the social relationships that are developed through the sharing of those ideas, through the technologies that are being used. So I look at those three aspects, ideas, uh, materials or technologies, and social relationships as really the, uh, the, the personal learning network that one looks at and designs and cultivates to promote his or her own learning. So I think the, uh, the point of asking the question, do you have a personal learning network, I think is interesting because I don't really even think that we develop a personal learning network out of nothing. I think we all have a network, whether we're 
uh, aware of its potential or not, whether we use technologies or not. I think we all have a personal learning network that we rely on to connect with others. I don't know, Petey, how you think about that. If you've thought about your own personal learning network, what it looks like, uh, it, how it's changed uh, over, you know, over time. Well, uh, it's it's really interesting because I'm thinking about my students and I'm thinking about the way they interact uh, outside the classroom, the way they interact through the technology they are using right now. I'm thinking about us talking in the halls of, of the university and discussing things and, and, and managing to mix this social environment at the same time that we share our academic ideas in order to have a better development. And then how that has an impact on the way I go to another person or another teacher and I have a discussion, maybe uh, taking back whatever I grasp from our conversations and same thing with the students, whatever they grasp among themselves and then coming to the teacher and having more questions or more ideas to, to also share in the classroom. Yeah, I mean, I, I look at a personal learning network as really an extension of the old days where teachers would uh, congregate in a, a teacher's lounge, right? And they just get together and they share ideas, thinking of it from a, from a teacher standpoint. But as we're also teaching teachers, uh, we have to look at our students too to see, well, how can we as their facilitators help them develop this awareness of their own personal learning network? Again, regardless of what kinds of technologies are involved or not. Um, I think it's interesting that uh, in this piece that I read that I shared with you here just a, a few minutes ago on, online and, and on screen, um, they mentioned that before something like only 15%, 15 to 20% of the teachers were really connected, uh, uh, quote unquote connected, uh, presumably online and that this was such a low number. And I think we have to be careful about looking at our network, our own personal learning network, only in terms of technology. I think that's perhaps uh, not the best way to look at it because I think that we need to look more importantly at the types of ties or connections that we have, not necessarily the number or not even necessarily the technology because I think that might be short-sighted depending on who we're connecting with. For me personally, I think a personal learning network really is um, the value of it depends on the type of connection. That is how we communicate, right? If you're connected with a person, uh, what does that person know uh, and how do you communicate how often and what type of uh, communication is set between those, those individuals and really looking at each individual in terms of how do you communicate? How often? And what are the means of communication? Again, uh, we, it's easy to think in terms of technology, but as you mentioned uh, so importantly, it could be just connecting with someone across the hall or, you know, down, you know, someplace close or maybe even a face-to-face -face setting in a convention and, and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and how those uh, learnings or, or ideas or or prompts for, for major thoughts, uh, change your mind or, or prompt your mind exactly to, to have a, a wider view of different situations, a different perspective, or maybe things that you uh, di didn't really consider come, come to whatever you are discussing, right? And yeah. as I tell my students, when they come here and we start having reflection and, and feedbacks and all that about whatever they do, they are, they are doing in their classroom. Uh, it's uh, whenever they have a moment in which they need more support, I may give an idea from my perspective, but uh, the most important thing about that idea is not to carry it out. It's to uh, generate more ideas, to help the students to generate their own ideas and their own transformation of whatever I come to suggest if it, if it is necessary. And, and them to, to be 100% sure that whatever they are thinking now uh, has come from uh, a major process. It's not just one point of view. It's this interaction and this communication. And, and as you mentioned, I think it's one of the basic con uh, concepts, communication to raise awareness. In your case, let's take a semester uh, 
uh, tutoring and practicum course. How many students typically do you have in that course? Uh, sorry, didn't hear that. Your your sound is getting like for moments. It's getting like a. Okay, I was asking about the uh, the course that you typically teach. Let's say an eighth semester practicum course. How many right. students typically take those those uh, types of courses? Oh, we know, we regularly have from from let's say sixteen to twenty two students more or less, and okay. they they go and have uh, their their practice, their teaching practice, real in a real group, in, in real schools at their choice, in, in the educational level at their choice. They are the students around, uh, let's say, around 18 years old, 18, 20 years old, around 20s, I guess, and, and they're just about to graduate. All right, so one of the lines that I read in this piece, uh, Cultivating and Growing Your Personal Learning Network, was, uh, alone we are smart, together we are brilliant. And I, I, I'm thinking about in terms of your class, let's say, you have a class of 20 students, and of course you have your one-to-one -one tutoring relationship that you're giving feedback uh, directly to the student based on what he or she's doing for that particular week, whatever he or she's working on. I'm wondering your thoughts about how we might integrate this idea of together we are brilliant, bringing in students uh, in the class where there's some sort of environment that they can really share those experiences and really take advantage of let's say their own quote unquote personal learning network, right? With being their classmates in this case, um, how that, what that might look like. And then the next level, the second part of that would be how could they do similar or have similar interactions maybe with people outside of their own class, even maybe outside your relationship as a tutor? Well, uh, yeah, it's interesting because uh, uh, somehow this individual work with each student in their reflection in whatever they do, it's coming to get uh, 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 this kind of community. And it's interesting you manage that because it's the kind of topic I'm gonna I, I'm gonna talk in a while. And uh, but the community is is being raised, and and we're taking the advantage of technology. Before we would use the 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 platform we are using for the class just as a repository of whatever they are uh, producing individually and the way the process goes and the way they are transforming their reflections, their lesson plans and all that. But right now it's been a year or maybe more than a year in which in my different classes, I've been doing, having these folders, individual folders shared among themselves. So, uh, and, and it's something that at the beginning, I was wondering if they would be comfortable with that and at the end, nobody mind, and, and they all know they have access to other folders and themselves, they bring into the conversations aspects from other students that they read and in, from which they, they grew some ideas and, and, and they want to try. And, and now it's becoming something a little bit more natural that during, during these sessions we have, mm, we all talked about uh, you can go to this folder and see this lesson plan. You can go to this reflection and see how this guy is reflecting or oh, something similar happened to this person. And, and, and it little by little, it's getting more common in such a way that I already have students who are coming in pairs, in pairs here to the, to the individual sessions, which are no longer individuals. Now, it's, it's a pair because they have a very similar group with a, uh, with a teacher, both of them with the same teacher, different groups. And pretty much they are working uh, almost hand to hand in planning and in in all this uh, material. So yes, it's becoming kind of a community. And now that you mention it, yeah, it, it would be interesting to have once in a while these uh, major sessions where everybody can can jump in with their opinions on certain topics. Right, twenty two students may be kind of difficult to to handle in this sharing and and, and exploring, but uh, I'm sure there will be a way. Yeah, I, I just, uh, you know, I don't teach in the practicum strand, but I think that, you know, I know that students have a lot of contact and a lot of opportunities in the lower uh, semesters or the earlier semesters, uh, sixth, seventh, sixth and seventh semester, for example, where they have a lot of opportunities to work together with classmates and share ideas. Um, and I know that as they get to the eighth semester, we're the expectation for them is that they are more independent and they should 
have a, lo a level of uh, interdependency in their own uh, teaching practice. But I, I still think it's very important um, for teacher trainers as they get as they become professionals and and start entering the field that this idea of working together and sharing that they probably are, maybe are more used to in the earlier semesters is really something that they should continue doing throughout their whole professional career. Um, and because I think that's really the basis as we've been talking about here of maintaining and cultivating and, and really understanding one's own personal right. learning environment. I feel like sometimes the perception is in general um, that we, once you're graduated and you're a teacher, that's it, you're on your own type of thing and you're, you're really just uh, working as, as you want and, and you, right. this idea of kind of sharing kind of takes a back seat, you know, and I think that really uh, sharing and, and making your own teaching practice as transparent as possible, I think is really the, the what underlines uh, being able to uh, share in a personal learning network and really being comfortable. I think it's just a matter of being comfortable. Are you willing to share and, uh, you know, share your materials and experiences with others uh, so that you can reap the benefits of maybe receiving uh, some benefit in the future? I, th I think uh, it may be part of the social aspect of this uh, network because uh, it's really important the way you get along with people and the way you what you, you said, that you're willing to give and receive and share and, and whatever is needed. It's, uh, I, it just came to my mind last year, I was in a course with, uh, with the teachers from uh, Programa Start here in Aguascalientes, which is the national language program for primary education. And one of the teachers that was there as a presenter, uh, uh, she was mentioning us that they have groups uh, for their planning that are that are uh, informal it's not something that is required they decided to get together once you know which group you're going to have and where you're going to be they get together with other teachers and they get together to plan once a week and and it's something that it may be uh, interesting to look at and and invite these these people to to share with us what happens in those sessions in which they create material they plan classes they share ideas and and uh, and it's something that it has become common amongst them. Some of them, I mean, it's it's something informal. And I know there are a couple of these groups around in town. A another thing that I've seen also is that in these uh, congresses and and uh, workshops they attend for preparation, they start to bond and they make uh, social links, which later become working links in which they support each other for their for their regular classes every day. Which which I happen to enjoy when I when I knew about that. Well, and I think the key point that you're making here for me is that these teachers are forming these groups on their own, regardless uh, of whether the authorities or coordinators or from the top are, are really pushing this. Uh, we're talking about some sort of organizational change from the bottom up. Right. And a, a lot of times, a lot can happen just yeah. on, on, on its own, just by having teachers rally together and form these groups, as you mentioned, regardless whether or not it's a policy, a school policy or, or, or not. Now, I would, you know, hope that at some point uh, this type of change is also a, a top-down type of uh, right. change where you get support from, from the top down. But I think, as you've mentioned, it's not uh, necessarily necessary. It's not always uh, a requirement that we can as teachers just on our own and oftentimes with limited resources form the groups form the the networks that we need for for a particular purpose and these purposes don't necessarily need to be group purposes what i mean by that is we you know and that the whole essence of a personal learning network for me is that there are two goals two potential goals that can be achieved one might be a group goal depending on if you're in a formal education in a school for example where you're working together for a common goal. But you can also see, I think we can imagine cases where working towards a common goal like that could also help us achieve individual goals. Let's say more specific, if we're looking at uh, increasing or improving our English proficiency or our certain skills in a certain area. You know, I think that we need to be looking at it honestly from those two perspectives 
so right. that um, you know people are willing to 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 participate. I think it's not selfish to think, well, you know, what am I going to get out of this experience uh, beyond this common goal of you know maybe that's stipulated in some school policy. Right. Uh, I mean, a lot to talk about this topic. I, I just remind again, uh, my, my thesis for the master's degree was uh, something that uh, a teacher came to tell me that it was kind of weird because I was talking about uh, autonomous language learning centers, the self-access centers. But my point was to create learning communities in autonomous language learning centers. And he was like, uh, and he was like, what, what are you talking about? What are you talking about here? But because it's autonomous learning and you want to create communities. But that was the point, that you get your individual goals and things that you want to reach, and you manage to make contact with others with similar goals or, or things that complement each other. And one of the cases I took in the master's was uh, one student that wanted to develop her listening skill, and she was really good at grammar and, and other aspects, and, and, and she could... Uh, create like uh, communication in, in, in a spoken way, but her listening was uh, was a problem. And, and she worked together with somebody that um, was really good at speaking, but, but had problems in grammar. And they managed to come together into a conversation club. And, and that was pretty much the point. It's a simple example of the idea that I had. And, and at the end, uh, uh, well, it's something that helps everybody in their individual goals. And at the end, they reach common goals at the same time. So it's a win-win situation. Yeah, uh, that's that's really what it's, I think, all about. I mean, I think that uh, whether we use the term personal learning network or not, I think this, we some would think that this is a, a, a buzzword. And uh, I know, um, you know, it's it's been used for, for some time now, but really that's what it boils down to is how do we uh, reach out and create a network where, uh, if we need support, okay. we know where to find it. Yeah. Right? We know what space we need to go to. We know which person. We know what ideas to share. We know who has more ideas or maybe better ideas than we have who are smarter than us. And really, it's just understanding, having this metacognitive awareness of our own uh, learning and our own network of learning so that we, um, you know, we are more proficient. We're better uh, people where we can, you know, learn as much as we can, and depending on the the particular set of circumstances. Right, and and that will be another big discussion. Getting into the social part, the attitudes that create this confidence to to approach people, the communication and ways of communication. I think we have a lot of material for further shows in here. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that uh, this our broadcast uh, is open to any educator who wants to participate, and we encourage everyone to participate in our Facebook page under Teacher Learning Cast, and feel free to uh, leave us feedback about the show, let us know what you think, provide us uh, any type of information that would help improve. Uh, we're always open for positive and negative uh, feedback, so feel free to uh, share. Also, if you want us to uh, talk about particular topics, feel free to share those as well. And of course, uh, we're always looking for educators to join us in the live broadcast on Saturday mornings uh, to hear from you, hear from your experiences. Yes, and for the, for the people that is following in Facebook Live, this is a secondary transmission in Facebook Live. The original transmission is in the link above, and, and uh, you can see Benjamin Stewart in, in a first plane and myself in a first plane, which is a better view and better sound of the transmission. So, uh, and please follow us. We also have our, our own websites and, and you can join us and you can get into Facebook and teacher learning cast and uh, look at like that. And uh, you can, uh, and you can see all our contacts in there. Right. So okay. what yeah. next? Yeah, so I think the next segment here, uh, Pity, you had some in, you had an interesting uh, uh, some information that you wanted to talk about uh, regarding peer learning communities, teachers who are participating in peer learning uh, communities. Right, and um, it's it's interesting because it, it's all related to what we were just discussing about uh, commu uh, learning communities, which and these uh, networks of, uh, that that we create. But uh, I wanted to look at it from a, from a perspective that uh, when I was thinking about the topic for this week, 
I it, it came to my mind uh, because of different reasons and, and talks with my students. Uh, what I've heard several times from different teachers that when you get into the classroom, you leave uh, your, uh, your personal life at the door and then you get into the classroom. And then uh, it's something that I've always, it's, it's a debatable perspective. Uh, but I was thinking the other way around. When you go outside the classroom, do you leave the teacher inside? That's what I, uh, I'm, with all that we have just said, it's obviously that we don't think so, right? But, but, but yeah, I mean, if you think you can leave the human being or the, the individual person, the, 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 um, the personal life at the door, that would imply you, you also tend to leave the teacher inside the classroom, right? And that was it may be it may imply that right that was pr precisely the starting of this so i started to research all right what are the roles of the teacher outside the classroom and i happened to come across different texts and articles which mention things like oh the teacher as a counselor the teacher as a coach in sports the teacher as uh supporting students in their trajectory in in the university which will be again like the tutor and, um, and different things like more related to still academic life inside the school itself, inside the institution. But then I came across a very interesting book, uh, which uh, I started to read the chapter, which I consider a little bit more related to this. And I want to share this uh, with, with you. Uh, I don't know if you can see in the screen, I'm going to share the cover of, the, of this book. Can you see it, Ben? Yes, I see it. All right. I, I happened to get my eyes on, on, on this book. And this book is a compilation of different projects and ideas in which learning communities are created. And, and every chapter has something interesting to, to read and to see about it. And uh, uh, maybe I want, want to scroll down a little bit for, for the index. So you can see every chapter is a different situation, right? And, and uh, everything goes for learning communities and, and the development. Uh, especially, I want to focus on this chapter too, which you can later uh, go and, and, and check and read and specifically and see different situations that, um, that uh, occur in Israel. And, and in a very specific community where teachers started to create different projects to make a transformation in education. And I, I kind of see uh, through the reading, I kind of uh, detect that one of the implicit goals, uh, though I haven't really came to the part where, where they really stated as a goal, but, I can, but, but implicitly you can see that, that one of the main goals is to integrate community, uh, different kind of people from the community, uh, different races uh, in the community come together and have the same opportunities in learning. So the projects are really interesting. And, I, I, and, and one of the things I, I saw in there, I saw a project about teachers going outside the classroom to talk to parents, to help parents develop uh, basic skills to support the students' uh, learning to create a uh, proper ways for the parents to know how to, how to handle learning situation with the students and promote learning, promote motivation, promote research, promote interaction and communication. But the work was from the teachers to the, to the parents outside. Another, another anecdote in there is about um, uh, students creating research outside the classroom along with the students, creating groups of research outside, which is a really interesting project, and coming with a new model of education and a proposal for a new, even a new kind of classroom uh, with a new setting, even the furniture and whatever you have in there. So, so it's kind of interesting. The point with all of this is that it came to be an example for me and, and, and kind of evidence of uh, the major impact that our lives outside the classroom have, and not only for learners, for everybody around. And, and I think it, that's not only for our, uh, in the academic sense, for, for our students. I think that's obvious for everybody around us in, in every community. But us as teachers, having learners, which uh, are in, in constant contact with us outside the classroom, 
I think it happens to be something really cr crucial to really reflect on. What is my role and how am I behaving? What am I doing outside the classroom that it's uh, having an impact, a direct impact on learners' life? What do you think about that? Yeah, uh, the, this was a very interesting uh, chapter. And as you mentioned, it was really about trying to bring students together, those students that tend to be marginalized. So I think most cultures can relate to certain groups of yeah. students that are marginalized, that, are, that, that for so, social economical reasons, uh, they don't have the same opportunities, um, both inside the classroom and outside the classroom in real life, of course. So I think one of the challenges actually, and thinking in our context in, in Mexico, uh, we certainly, depending on the, the parts of Mexico that where you reside, uh, you know, we're gonna see certain students that are, are marginalized. But I think what we need to try to help our teacher trainers realize is that one of our goals is to try to integrate all all students. And I think even from a linguistic standpoint, you're gonna we're gonna have students who are struggling uh, with the language, some more so than others. And so our goal is to how can we facilitate this process of bringing those students together? And I think this chapter really addresses this. Uh, they talk about a um, a group investigation model right. where they they look at four features. And I think it's important to mention these four features, one being investigation, two being interaction, three interpretation, and four intrinsic motivation. Right. So I think those four, investigation, interaction, interpretation, and intrinsic motivation, trying to incorporate those four into this inquiry-based uh, learning approach, I think is, is really interesting. I, I wrote a piece a couple of years ago on 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 this very topic about how to bring in research into uh, uh, an everyday classroom, right? So teachers or students or teachers would help students find ways to collect data, mm -hmm. and regardless of the course, right? They would do they would collect data. So maybe it's an interview, maybe it's a survey, maybe right. they observe something outside of class, but they help them actually collect the data. They analyze it to a degree, and then they present it. And I think it's very much in line with the same um, same uh, chapter where they talk about these six stages of this uh, this group investigation model as as the classroom number one, the class the class determines uh, a tool or organization and research group, so they actually form the groups themselves. And then number two, the plan the group plans some sort of investigation. Right. Number three, the groups carry out the investigation. Number four, the groups then plan how to present their their findings. Number five, the groups make a presentation. And six, the stu teacher and students evaluate their projects. So it's kind of involved, It's it's, but it, I think it's worth looking at these stages in more depth, more and in more depth that we can possibly talk about it today. But I think that having your point about the teacher working very closely with the students Right. And then forming groups that they're forming these discovery opportunities, these inquiry-based uh, learning opportunities for them to really search out uh, information. And in this case, in different cultures, really to learn about each other's cultures. I think, again, linguistically, we can look at parallels, how we can do something very similar so that the weaker students can really integrate and interact with students that maybe have a higher language proficiency. Right. right. I, I, I see it as an, an, an investment because uh, the work you do and, and whatever you, you, you work with the students, which, which happens to be outside the classroom also and, and, and focus on personal needs, personal background, and aspects of interest for, or for the community, not just for the student, but for the community itself. And, and, it's, and it's paying well for the classroom advantages. It's helping the classroom, it's helping the students to develop their learning. Learning becomes a lot more meaningful and the impact is direct because the impact is in the community. So, uh, but, but that's a teacher that it's, uh, that it's not taking the suit off. And, and that's pretty much the question. And is there a moment in which you take the teacher suit off 
when you go outside the classroom, is it really a moment in which you step outside and you leave it inside? Or you step outside the school and you live it inside the school or the other way around? Because that's a two-way reflection. When I come into the classroom, can I really leave myself being my individual outside? Oh, I think it's, uh, I can give my opinion in that, but, but it's more important for teachers to reflect on that. Uh, do I really, do I really have a moment in which I stop being a teacher? Do I really have a moment in which I can live uh, without, I mean, moments without my personal life, without my problems. And I think it all goes in this, in, in this big uh, bowl that, 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 that grows and grows and has an impact. Now, uh, what I see in this book it, are the examples of uh, keeping the suit at all time, or maybe not even having a suit. I mean, being, just being, being a teacher at, at all time and, and, and Focusing on the on the, I see as one of the objectives, the grew uh, the development and the change in the community uh, itself. Not only students; they are looking at the students as the base of the community, obviously, but they are also involving more and more people because students are going outside to do research. Teachers are going outside to talk to parents and have these workshops and, and train parents if needed. I mean, in, in a different model, you can see in this, in, in this, uh, in this chapter of the book. But, uh, but all of this goes to the idea of having a direct, immediate impact in the community beyond whatever learning the students may have along, along the line, right? But, but everything is, it's, it's again what, what we discussed earlier today, a network, and, and, and how, how far you want to get this network. So I go back to the original thought of, of, of how this all, all, all comment started, is um, me as a teacher, what kind of impact am I causing outside the classroom? Uh, do I really take the suit off? Do I, my, is my behavior affecting a student, my behavior outside the classroom? Yeah, I know we all have personal lives and I totally agree with personal lives, but, uh, but we do have a community in which we live in and, and in small places like Aguascalientes, which is not that big, uh, we all have close contact with different people outside teachers and students outside the classroom. So do I really take the teacher suit off and what impact does that cause in my students first and then in the community itself? Yeah, I mean, if we look at you know, how we communicate um, and how we, what roles that we take outside of the classroom, I think we need to ask ourselves, am I taking a teacher role or a learner role? I, the question you're asking about, do we take the suit off or not? Um, if we can uh, leave the suit on in two ways, we can teach and facilitate outside the communi community or, or outside of the classroom, or we can uh, Put on a the the student role and and look at ourselves as learners as 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 teachers do and say okay I'm I'm a teacher but I'm, I'm also I need I have an obligation to uh, learn something maybe outside the classroom because of course we're learning inside the classroom on a day to day basis with our students but more importantly I think sometimes is just to find time to dedicate to ourselves as as a learner so that we are continually. Uh, hopefully improving and learning more as we gain experience because I, as you know PD we've, uh, we've talked about this too is you know experience is just a number you know how, ma how many years have you been teaching right that's but it's really the engagement that took place in those years of experience that matter and uh, I think it really relates to this question that you pose taking the suit off or not okay and what kind of role are you uh, pursuing a teacher role or a learner role. Now, yes, and, and this is something we, we have discussed a little bit before, uh, that we keep on being learners at all time, and we we'll also learn from our students and from the happenings inside and outside the classroom. But I want to add a little bit, another piece to the puzzle <laughs> and, and see uh, what can we reflect about this. So this formula of uh, not taking the suit off or, or, or not even having a suit, being a, just being a teacher uh, as part of your life, as part of your individual life too, or the other way around, I mean, any way you want to see it, 
inside outside the classroom at technology uh, technology in the sense of communications means in which your students can reach you at all time and i know this is a touchy topic because uh how how much can you uh, attend students needs when they are really needs or when they are not needs and they are just uh, moments in which they urge for something and they contact you through technology and they need immediate answers because of any reason, because of a fair reason or because of a neglective reason, some in which um, they, they, are, uh, they are not really considering that they are maybe doing things at the last minute and that's when they need the help. Or maybe it's somebody that really actually it's working hard on that and really needs the support. So, so I'm adding this, this piece to the puzzle. This uh, speed up that we talked in the first program, speeding up uh, the, the contact communication and speeding up uh, the situation in the classroom, it's also for the outside. So uh, what do I do? Uh, when do I stop? Uh, uh, how can I handle situations when students need me urgently in my non-working hours? So what about my my teacher suit or am I am I really taking out the suit or what? I mean, it's a difficult uh, I know it's difficult difficult question or a difficult issue to to really answer, but uh but it's there and and I think it's true and I and I'm for sure you have lived that then. Yeah, and it's interesting as you mentioned this, I'm I'm thinking uh now sli at a slightly different perspective about this question question about when do we take the suit off how do we take the if we even take the suit off right and i think it really boils down to when i look at a course and again we're talking in formal education that's our context so within yes. some sort of school structure where there's a syllabus and there's a curriculum so looking at a particular course for me it all boils down to three aspects mm -hmm. the first is what kind of communication between students themselves and students and myself as the instructor need to take place in order for them to achieve their course objectives. For example, synchronous versus asynchronous communication, real-time uh, communication versus communication over time. That's one. Number two, is the interaction going to be online or offline? That is, is it going to be face-to-face is it going to be online or some combination of some sort of blended uh, delivery system? Okay, so we have types of communication, we have types of delivery, and the third is the educational uh, theory or theories that are integrated in the classroom. Uh, what kind of theories and and philosophies of education do does the teacher uh, have that is going to obviously influence the educated educative experience but i think it's a combination of those three not looking at any one of those but looking at types of communication synchronous versus asynchronous the delivery system online or offline and right. the theory or theories that are involved but taking those three together and i think that will get to a closer answer to when do we take the suit off or not because um i think as you mentioned you know and i know we've talked about it uh, a lot that you know the if our educative experience oftentimes and the educative experience of our students extend beyond the face-to-face -face classroom just because of these <clears throat> same interactions that happen they email us or they send you know some sort of uh, forum group or whatever communication that happens outside of the classroom really influences what happens in the classroom so it all it, it actually becomes difficult to separate just looking at the educative experience face-to-face physically in the classroom versus what happens outside because they intertwine a lot as as we in our case use technology a lot to help students you know again in and out of the classroom right right and and, and well it, it's all the big situation that and and it it requires uh maybe a deep analysis or, or even research to see all this but this book uh, coming back to the beginning of all of this uh uh, this book that I came across, I think it, it has a good sample and evidence of um, of uh, making things beyond the classroom, which have a direct, immediate impact, and not only in the students, 
in communities. And, and, and I go to another question. What is the goal uh, of helping our students to develop the language or whatever course we are teaching? What is the goal of helping our students in their formal education? I think one of the ultimate goals is that they go and be and, and are a productive, uh, positive uh, force, to call it some way, in our communities, in benefit of everybody in the community. Oh, I, you're someone off, I guess, then? You have, you have sorry, your sound. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. I got uh, my computer locked up there for a second. Uh, yeah, ab absolutely. Um, I think, Pity, uh, I think we might want to go ahead and uh, talk about some of our experiences. We're getting a little bit close to time here to, to finish up. But, um, but I think, yeah, your point is well taken about the, you know, what our roles are both in and out of the classroom. And I think it really relates well to personal learning networks and how we more globally look at our own per professional development as learning experiences and how we can really use those uh, to have a better or bigger impact on what we do in the classroom with our students. Yes. yes. Well, and before going on, I want to remind uh, everybody that we have ways of contact and we are waiting for you to contact us, make comments, uh, leave, uh, send an email, leave a message and tell us what you want to talk about, what you want to discuss. Tell us if you want to come live with us one day, you are invited to do so. Uh, and, and whatever you need, uh, there is contact in the different networks. In, in Facebook, we have the TLC, uh, Teacher Learning Cast Group. Uh, you can get, uh, the, well, the, the, the Facebook uh, fan page and you can get there and, and see all the posts related to this cast. And uh, for the Facebook live transmission, you can click the link above and you can get to a better transmission with a different angle view of, of this and a better sound. And uh, before running out of time, uh, Ben, the experience of the week, which I like this because it happens to be something that... Uh, happens to us during the week, and this is our catharsis. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I'd like to kind of extend our conversation from last week. Last week, I shared an experience with a, um, a writing group, a fourth semester writing course that I'm teaching, where we shared an, I shared an experience where we, uh, I worked with my group by sharing a list of writing errors, and they self-corrected based on the list of errors. So I I didn't really provide a lot of direct feedback on an individual basis, but instead gave kind of a group uh, a list of errors that they then checked each one by one, and we checked those as, as a group and clarified doubts. And I wanted to do something similar uh, this week with my propedeutic uh, group. So I, I have a first year uh, student writing group um, this semester. And uh, they are developing their first academic five-paragraph essay. And I did something similar where I shared a list of errors, and I asked them to check and make corrections on their own work. The next day, I shared the same list, and I had them partner up with uh, a, a, a student from a, a classmate from another group. I actually have two propate groups, right? So I had them partner up with a, a, a classmate from the other Prope group. So they weren't uh, in contact with them directly at the time that they were uh, leaving the comments. And I had them take the same list and have them made, make comments uh, to their partner group. And using the same list, I had them find three things that the partner did well, three things that the partner uh, needed to consider or that, that didn't do uh, all that well. Uh, I need to back up and say that I asked my students to actually create those two same lists for their same for their first uh, as they evaluated their own work. So they already had their own personal list of things they did well, things that they needed to consider. So they partnered up, they left comments uh, in Google Docs, and and then the rest of the week they went back to their own document and taking into consideration their partner's comments and also just taking another look and becoming more familiar with the list, they corrected their own work and we spent the rest of the week doing the rest of the three days 
doing that type of activity. So I applied a survey to this group, to both Propi groups, basically asking how they felt about that experience. Okay, very specific to what I just explained about their self uh, self assessment and peer assessment, how they felt about giving assessment, how they felt about conducting their own assessment. And I wanted to take a few minutes to share some of the findings uh, that that came about. And this was this week that uh, this happened. One of the questions was, how did you feel about having an opportunity to self-assess? And it was on that, like I used a Likert scale from one to five. So the Likert scale for almost all of these questions was one meant I hated it, okay. five meant I loved it. So in this first question, how did you feel about having an opportunity to self-assess or self-correct your own work based on the list of written elements? The, the, the list of writing elements, again, were the list of uh, mistakes or errors that I, I developed based on my uh, review of all of their, their work. So I created that list. Mm -hmm. And as you noticed here, um, most of the students uh, actually loved it. And you'll see here four answered here. We have like almost nine answered four and about four students answered three. I should start off by saying that uh, this is the breakdown between Prope A and the Propedeutic A and Propedeutic B groups. Um, these groups are not by level. These are just uh, arbitrary, random, randomly divided up groups. Okay. And uh, 27 students participated. I have 29 total students, so two students did not participate. 27 out of the 29 participated. This is the breakdown here, so I should have said that first. Okay. But basically, you see here it was it was uh, favorable for for most. So I would say four students really uh, didn't have much of opinion. They were split down the middle. Uh, a similar question was asked though about uh, how did you feel about having an opportunity to assess your classmates' work. So now this is them taking kind of a teacher role, and you'll notice here that although somewhat favorable. Uh, you can see that they didn't feel quite as comfortable uh, leaving comments to their classmates' work. And I think this is understandable, uh, being that, uh, again, this is a uh, probably an A2 level group, if, according to the Common European Framework. So this is a probably a high basic level, uh, English proficiency level. So uh, I think it's natural uh, to probably not be all that, uh, all that uh, comfortable. But for you can see that there was still somewhat favorable, and there was uh, no responses under uh, the non-favorable uh, side. Ben, uh, it, it would be maybe interesting to have a focus group on that issue itself, about uh, mm -hmm. wh why, why, uh, why they have this perspective of uh, having the opportunity to assess classmates, just for the sakes of knowing. <laughs> Yeah, you know, absolutely. This was kind of, um, you know, for time purposes, and I, I wanted to try to put together something for today's show. Uh, yeah, definitely, uh, I need to do a focus group, get a little bit more information, get some uh, quantitative uh, inter or qualitative, I should say, qualitative information here to kind of support uh, these results. Absolutely. Right. Um, another question, how did you feel about receiving feedback from your classmates? So it looks like more students felt comfortable receiving feedback and yeah. some were a little bit slightly less comfortable. But I still think that they, it was still favorable. I, I was actually surprised. I was really anticipating more negative responses uh, to either receiving feedback or giving feedback or even self-correcting. I, I wasn't really sure going into it, um, you know, especially at a, a level, a, a group at this level, at a lower level. And again, this is the first time that they were asked to create a five paragraph essay. So this is the context with which they are answering uh, these particular questions. Uh, we're looking at five paragraphs, an introduction paragraph, three body paragraphs, and a conclusion. So a lot of the things that they were asked to do for this first essay was uh, complete, were completely new to them. Yeah, that's why I, I, I was really interested on in knowing the whys because I would expect them also not going to the negative side, but they didn't. <laughs> yeah, 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 me too. Um, let's see, another one. How did you feel about the order in which they first self-assessed and then provided feedback? So this was more about the, the order of the week, you know, again, starting out with the self-assessment uh, first, then providing 
peer feedback and then receiving their peer feedback and then continuing with their um, self-assessment. And this, these are the results, very similar to uh, this up here as far as how they uh, answered. Another interesting thing was the time that it took to answer. If you notice, like this question took on average uh, 3.96. Now, I'm assuming these are seconds, okay? Yeah. I'm assuming these are seconds. Yeah, yeah. Um, but these, this one was pretty quick versus some of these that maybe took a little bit longer. How did you feel about the way that your instructor provided feedback? So I was curious about how they – because – the way that I provided uh, feedback, and I need to kind of explain this a, a little bit, I, some students would ask for feedback, whether in class or outside of class, but not, it didn't happen a lot. But I did, anytime anybody asked me, I would give them feedback, but I did not make it a point uh, to provide feedback directly to their, uh, to their documents, again, unless they asked. So, mm -hmm. So, you know, depending on the class, you know, sometimes they would ask me and I wouldn't leave comments in their Google Docs. Sometimes they would send me an email outside of class and I would leave a comment to their Google Docs. So it really varied just depending on uh, who asked for what. And, you know, sometimes they would ask me questions and I would just turn it over to the whole group uh, and have a discussion there and I would write something on the board. So it really was varied in the way that I was giving feedback. But I was curious how they felt about how I gave feedback during this week. And again, all of these questions are related to this, this week, this, these sets of experiences. And uh, it looked like, uh, you know, they, they were uh, in favor in general of, of how that turned out. Um, so that's, that's one thing. Uh, another one here, these last two questions here, and it's hard to tell uh, because they look like the exactly same question, but the, the types of responses are, are different. Which best describes the way you felt this week? Okay, now this question um, is how they uh, if they how they felt they learned. Let me see if I get this right here. I'm sorry. The second question is what how they learned. This one here over here on the right is if they felt that they learned a lot or if they felt they they didn't learn. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, and. Okay, I'm blanking out. Okay, the, okay, and then the first one is how they felt about the instructor feedback. So it's kind of similar to this other question. How they felt about instructor feedback, and then how much the second this question on the right is how much they felt they learned okay. throughout the week. The point here is that they felt pretty good, I think, about the way the I the that the instructor that I provided feedback, but some were they felt that it was a little bit of a struggle, I think for the learning, they, that they thought it was kind of difficult, basically, that they, they felt that they learned, but maybe maybe some felt that they learned not as much as others. Okay. And I, I'm going to share some one open question here at the bottom, I think, that will help shed some light on this particular question. Um, one question here at the end was that the um, – all of them finished the essay. I, one question was, did you finish the five-paragraph essay? Because I think that was also uh, mm -hmm. kind of related. All of them but one answered that they did. Now, um, let me open up uh, very quickly. Uh, let me open up one of – because I don't see the open question. I want to share those these open questions only because it sh sheds light on one of the uh, points here that – so let me give me just one second here. In fact, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and, and open up the, the link, and then I'll come back to you. But um, I don't know. I felt it was interesting, and I, I'm, I always have an interest in self-assessment, like what students can do on their own, right, and, and, and giving them the opportunity because sometimes we – at least in my case, I feel like sometimes I don't give my students enough opportunity to do things on their own, maybe, and really try to realize that, you know, that they are more autonomous, maybe, that I'm willing to give them credit for. So I, I, I always try to find some opportunities to do that. I don't know if you've had a, an experience, Petey, where you've kind of let them kind of go on their own and, and they have, uh, you know, been able to achieve something kind of on their own without you intervening. Oh, 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 yeah. yeah. I think lately, lately, I've been 
uh, uh, trying, trying to, to lead my individual session towards, towards that, that side. side. Having, Having the students, students doing all the talking and, and uh, uh, me uh, doing the suggestions or whatever I have to say until they require them. If they don't, well, I, then don't. I just keep on asking. And uh, But it, it raises um, a question to me. Do you think uh, they are aware of how they feel about this self-assessment and peer assessment before you ask them about it? Uh, well, yeah, that's a good question. I, and, and that's why I asked the question. I mean, I, I don't know how, how you know, my, my feeling is, because I, I would have to ask actually ask them uh, yes. that question. But yeah, my feeling is that, you know, the students in general aren't as aware unless we ask them to think about it. You know, I mean, I think that's one of the things that I want to try to do is to bring about this awareness. Um, and... But yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I, I, I really don't know. Maybe they were already aware that they yeah, liked yeah. something. And the you second know. question, the second question, following up this one, uh, are they really aware before you ask them? And now, once you ask them, does it cause a, a major impact or, or a different point of view, or, or does it cause an effect in them being aware of how they feel about self-assessment and peer assessment? Well, I, I think that if they are if they are sharing uh, an idea, saying if they say, well, you know, I hadn't thought about it, but you know, I like I like how I I like having the opportunity to self assess my work before I get a grade. Right. And if they make that awareness, I think that's a good thing. If right. they answer, you know, I don't like self awareness, and I, as their instructor, continue to force them to do it, that I, and knowing that they don't like it well, then I guess that's going to have a different outcome. And so I think the part of it is, yes, helping students become self-aware, but also becoming self-aware as the instructor. So I'm hopefully making the, the better decisions in the future uh, so that they, you know, that they're engaged, right? So that was the purpose, too, to see, is, is this working for with my group? Do they like it or not? Should I do something similar because we're going to write another essay next unit and – you know, and all of this goes into my planning and reflection and consideration for future classes to say, okay, let's either try this or let's try something different. Right. Now, I don't know students, but for example, in my case, if when I'm, when I suddenly open my eyes about something I did myself or something I reflect on about my own actions, well, it causes an impact because then it, it becomes a commitment to myself. Well, and in writing specifically, um, you know, writing is like, uh, you know, these errors that I shared with them, these are common errors that every single writer at every single level that I come in contact with face. And these are errors that I talk about over and over and over. So, I mean, one of the reasons why I did it this way, because this is the first time I've tried this, okay. uh, was that um, I, I, and it was kind of a selfish reason, I thought, well, does it make sense to leave the same comment 29 times to every document? Or can I just say it once and have them become self-aware so maybe they actually learn? I don't have to, you know, do as much, you know, mm -hmm. thinking, you know, smartly here, right? How can I work smarter, not harder? Yes. And, and, you know, and I think – at least now, my first feeling is that maybe I'm on to something. Maybe this might work in the future. I don't know. But it's a small sample group. But the idea is that trying to uh, have them – I'm certain that if students keep going through this list, they're going to be get better and better at not, not uh, causing – not writing the error to begin with. And second, being able to detect it if they do. And I, I just, so the idea was that, was that they just try to become a little bit more self-aware of these particular set of errors that, that, that we came in contact with. So, um, yeah, that's basically, I, I don't want to take up more time because I want to give you some time to, to, to talk about your experience. But, but that was something that I wanted to share. Um, and I think it's something that we'll probably end up talking about in the future because I think uh, 
these types of experiences, I think for me in my own particular case, relate a lot to the writing process and, and courses that I tend to teach quite often. Yeah, I, I think, uh, and it's worth it to explore it, and, and it's worth it to 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 go on these discussions. I mean, and that's a good thing of being online, live, and in YouTube, because we manage our own time. And today, Saturday morning, every Saturday morning we are here, we can take a couple of minutes extra. It doesn't matter. Uh, as long as it's an interesting discussion for you all, we invite you to give us comments and, and ask questions or give us suggestions or, or whatever you have to say to join us. You're invited to come if you want to. This is, this is what we want this show to be, like uh, not really a show, but a, a sharing space for all teachers that are interested, all right? So you can uh, take a glance at our, our, our uh, fan page in Facebook, uh, Teacher Learning Cast. And you can also click in, in YouTube. We have the live transmission, and then we have it on demand, all right? And also in Benjamin's uh, uh, website and in my own website. And uh, you can find all this information at the, at the fan page in Facebook, Teacher Learning Cast. And well, uh, yes, I want to take a couple of minutes to talk about um, my experience of the week, which uh, uh, was a moment uh, of light at the end of the week. Yesterday, Friday, I was... Uh, with one of my students discussing about the class that she was planning for her practicum, practicum. And, um, and, and she came with a question. She, she had two videos to use in the classroom, the same thing. She was going to show a game in a video, and, and she was, it, it, pretty much she was going to work like the instructions. This is the way the game is played, and we are going to do it in the classroom, right? But she had two videos, one video with famous people, and another video with two kids playing the game. Now, uh, according to what she said, because I haven't watched the videos, the video with the famous uh, characters, I think it was Madonna and, and Justin Bieber or somebody else, something like that, was really fun. And the activity was, uh, it was really dynamic and it was in a show, in a TV show. So you know how this happens and, and the, the, the purpose is to engage people into the show. So that was one of the videos. And the other video was a couple of kids just playing it, which in her opinion was a little bit more boring and not that engaging, but a lot more explicit in the rules for the game because it even had the, the, the written description in the video of the game. So she was aware that it was, uh, the, the, the kids video was really clear to understand. And the famous people video was really engaging, but there may be the risk of not being that clear. And the point in here was, how do I make the decision? Clarity over our motivation, of, I mean, motivation and engagement over uh, clarity in the instructions. And, 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 and she, what she wanted me to do is to tell her which one to use. And, and, and going back to our, our previous talk, yeah, I didn't give in an answer. I just asked, I just went to the, what I want to make the point today, making the right decisions in the classroom because of the right reasons. She had, and I don't know what she decided. This is something we're going to discuss next week. Uh, you have, she had, she has to decide on which video to use. But my point was to make her aware of what is the right reason to decide. Because the first thing is, uh, is it just because it's famous people? Is it just because I consider it's, it's fun it's, or it's funny or just because I myself think and, and, and I started to raise the, try to help her and raise the awareness on what is the right reason to make the right decision. Because uh, uh, on a personal point of view, well, our engagement, it's as important as the clarity and, and both things can be coped. So, uh, so that's, that's the main point of all this example. Uh, what can lead you to make the right decision for your students or for your class. Now, what's the right reason to do it? Uh, and that's a question, just a question. I mean, not an answer. Uh, I have my own ideas. And last week we discussed about uh, something that may be related to, to this. Uh, but I come with the word that you constantly use, Ben, and, and, and I think it's important, awareness. Awareness of what? something that we have previously talked in, in former shows, uh, we have talked about knowing our students. And, and it's something that she came to understand by all this questioning and, and all this back and forth on what's the right decision. 
And yes, she managed to have a little bit of uh, herself came to the awareness of, right, it's, it's also, I mean, it's not just me, it's about a student. I'm, me as a teacher have some control and have some ideas and maybe more experience uh, on certain aspects, but the students are the stars of the show. So I need to consider them. And, and, and at the end, what the way we ended this, uh, the way we, we didn't end the, 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 the topic, we just paused it while she decided what to do, is that uh, it's really important to know your students. That's the first thing about it. It's really, really important to know your students. And my final question, which, which I didn't expect an answer at that moment, is do you know your students well enough as to make a decision on which video? Uh, because there was an extra issue in the video. There was something related to a sexual comment in the famous people video. And, uh, and it became part of, of, of the decision, like, how oh, can I bring this into the classroom? And, and, and I didn't exactly know what the comment was, but, but uh, at the beginning she was with the idea that, yeah, but it's, it's something, I mean, it's not something uh, that, um, that would cause a big impact uh, or, or it's something that uh, it's just going to pass by, no problem. But when we came to the idea of knowing your students and she became aware of, yeah, well, one of my, my, the aspects I need to consider is my students and how well I know them. Then she started to wonder, well, uh, yes, I consider that comment not, that, not a problem and not an issue to deal with, but would my students consider in that way the same thing? So when we started to get this reflection on making the right decision for the classroom because of the right reasons, and it's something that is going to, it's a to be continued for next week and see what happened with that video. And then at the end, uh, well, I just started to think about different topics uh, or different situations in the classroom that may take us to this situation of, of impact, right? Of, uh, to what helped us to make the right decision about things like the topic itself for the classroom, for example. The topic that, that we are going to use in the classroom or the material selection for the classroom, the context we're going to bring, uh, uh, my attitudes or my reactions towards discipline, the vocabulary I'm going to teach. Certainly, I've had these questions a lot of times. Should, shall I teach my students uh, swearing words or things like those? And, and uh, the kind of projects you are going to involve them. I mean, it's a bunch of decisions. And the question is, are you making the decision because of the right reason? What about that, Ben? Yeah, um, there's so many things there. I mean, this is a really, a really good topic that we could again talk a lot about. Uh, but one thing that really comes to mind, especially when you look at games, I, I'm constantly uh, reminded of uh, Wiggins and McTie's book, uh, Learning by Design, where um, they talk about specifically games as being engaging being efficient and being effective. And so when I talk about and think about games and I'm talking with learners or, or, or teachers about games, it's very easy, I think, to look at games as being engaging because they're fun, they're attractive, they're, you know, they're, they're kinesthetic, whatever. They're, they're, it's easy to see students really participate well in, in those. But as language teachers, we also need to look at, well, how effective is it and how efficient is it? So how effective is it? Is, is it meeting some sort of linguistic or uh, conceptual goal? Uh, what is the goal of the, of the game? So that would be like one, one driving question, right? Okay, so this game looks fine, that's fine, it's appropriate. And this whole idea of uh, the sexual nature of the, uh, of the particular comment or the game or whatever, that's almost another issue. But, that, but the idea is, uh, is this a game appropriate for the particular set of learners? Okay, that's one. Now, what kind of goal, linguistic or otherwise, uh, is uh, to be achieved for participating in this game? And then how efficient, that is, how long it will it typically take for them to achieve this goal, right? So engagement, efficiency, and effectiveness. Looking at those three aspects and really forming questions with teacher trainers and if you're doing it yourself, considering those three aspects, okay, why am I applying this game? Okay, it's fun, but what kind of linguistic goal am I looking to achieve? 
and how long is it going to take to get it? Is it going? You know, and and these are I know complex questions, but I think they're very important so that we're not just looking at the engagement aspect. That we're not just saying okay, uh, it's fun. And now I'm not saying there's not any been. There, I don't want to say that games also don't have some role in the classroom just for engagement purposes, because I do see uh, cases where, let's say that a classroom is very stressed or whatever, and, and you see a need just to kind of let them relax a little bit and maybe have them participate in the game in a short, you know, for a short amount of time, just to kind of uh, relieve some of that stress. I see, I see a benefit there, but. You know, a lot of times we're looking at games to also achieve some sort of uh, linguistic goal in our cases, being language teachers, or some sort of content-based goal where they're learning something. You know, what are they learning about uh, when they participate in this? So uh, those those things, these this comes to mind when you bring this up, uh, Petey, about really looking at how we can incorporate games and, and help them become self-aware. How can they share this information with us? Because as tutors, maybe we don't even have, you know, maybe we don't even know for sure what the goal is to even guide them unless they tell us a little bit more about what their thinking is in terms of the efficiency and the effectiveness, really kind of going in deep into those aspects, uh, whereas the engagement aspect might be kind of obvious, you know, whether it works or, or not. Right. And it, it, it all goes back to planning and, and something I work a lot with all my students at all in, in all practicas, practicum classes. Uh, are they planning based on an objective or are they planning based on the activity? Uh, which may bring this, uh, this is just what you didn't mention about games is just an example. Uh, maybe it's a, a really uh, something that we can take advantage of. But because of the uh, conscious or unconsciously, consciously or unconsciously plan on having the game itself, the teacher uh, centers the whole class around the game. And uh, well, that may be a problem. Whether the same game, when you plan from the perspective of the objective, comes to be really effective and you even you start to modify the activity itself, the game itself, to fit the purposes of the class, the objectives of the class. Uh, and that was, that was one of the things we were discussing with, with this student that, um, uh, the, well, we, I was talking about the video itself and the use of the video, but yes, actually it was a game and she was intending to use the game because she likes the game. And, but the way the game was, its play uh, would ask students to practice an uncommon way of a grammar structure that is not normally used. And, and, and so I started to ask her if she was aware of that. And she was saying like, well, but it's a correct structure. All right, but it's not the common structure. And do you think that's the structure that it's going to come uh, in the exam? Do you think whomever, whoever evaluates them, it's going to agree that that's what they expect? Or what's going to happen to the regular form that, or the most common structure on this tense? And, and do you think it's worth it to avoid it to use the structure of the game? And, 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 it, and it all goes back to the objective. What is the objective? The game or the language that is going to be developed, right? And, and, and we can go on with this discussion and, and talk about all of the elements that have to be considered for the topic, the context, the function, the et cetera, et cetera, and, right? Uh, but yes, uh, my point in here is, is, is that uh, we have to really be careful about making the decisions in the classroom because of the right reasons. Uh, and, and the right reasons uh, are focused on the objectives with the students in the classroom, are focused on the characteristics of our students, uh, uh, maybe also focus on the, um, on the school itself, the policies from the school itself, and, and, and whatever... Uh, uh, whatever um, uh, the the school intends to, for example, a humanistic approach or a more communicative approach, or maybe just uh, a school which is based on developing in students the skill to speak, and that's it. So all of this uh, may influence uh, our decisions, and sometimes, as you just mentioned in your example, is what well, we take 
uh, less in consideration. We focus on the game, and that's it. Yeah, and, and if, you, if you boil down a particular grammatical structure that happens to be the focus of that game, and you're saying that this grammatical structure is not even worth considering, then it really is less about the game. It really has nothing to do with, about the game. The game right. is not even the, the, the issue. The issue is, okay, first of all, what grammatical structure, structures, or linguistic aspect are we even evaluating? And then starting there and then saying, okay, well, how can we engage them? Okay, well, maybe a game or whatever. But I think even maybe starting, as you're saying, starting with the, if the what is the goal? Is it effective? And then more importantly, too, and, and often harder, is to find the efficiency of that. Like how efficient, how you know, how much practice are they actually getting of that grammatical structure by participating in that game? So all those questions, I think, um, need to kind of unfold. And, um, you know, again, students need to become self-aware of that, uh, yeah. you know, in their planning stages and implementing and, and evaluating. I think it's, you know, the, personally, and I know that we have a semester to to complete a course, but you know, students going into something and uh, they have knowing that as a tutor, maybe that things aren't going to go well, as long as they learn from that experience. I think that's, right. it's almost, uh, you know, I would see a, a big benefit of actually going into a, a situation thinking probably this is not going to work, but I'm going to see what I can learn from it and, and then move on is something um, to, to consider. Because again, for me, I feel that you know, if students can uh, learn to reflect and become aware on their own of these issues, they retain it a lot more than if we just tell them, you know, that this is the way it is or, or this is our opinion on something. Uh, so yeah. it's really just trying to find those opportunities to make that happen. And, and it's sometimes difficult. Well, not difficult, but the thing is that it takes time some time, back and going back and forth until the students realize and uh, well, just to sum up, I, 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 at the end, uh, I started to reflect on uh, when do you see this kind of situation like that, that it's really important to consider the right reason why to make a decision? Well, the first thing is that I think at all times, at all times in the classroom, you need to look for the right reason, not for the sake of doing something or because you think so. Uh, maybe that you think so, uh, maybe apply if you are really aware of different aspects in, in the classroom. But things like politics, religion, sex, violence in the classroom, well, there are things that those are really points in which uh, it's easier to, to, to be aware that you have to be very careful and you have to decide and uh, write things about it uh, just as a suggestion. And then uh, it may be not that uh, positive to make the decision because you believe something that it's in one way that, that, that it's right, just because you believe it's right and, and you don't have a really background on why it is right. Or, or make a decision on something because uh, people have told you so, what you just said, because somebody told you so and you make that decision because somebody told me. Or uh, make a decision because you consider it's taboo, uh, and because you consider it and that's it. And, and it's all about your beliefs and, and, and your character and the way you have been developing all, uh, your, your, your personal growth and, and knowledge and, and, and just being careful about making decisions because of that only and, um, and what you believe about the students. Be careful with what you believe. You need to be a little bit more conscious and uh, aware of uh, our students and how they are really like. It may be better to look at uh, as a basing point in your decision, the relationship you establish with the students, the relationship you have so far with them as to how well you know them and what can you decide for them is better in their learning, having learning as the objective. And uh, what I don't know about the students also may be a good aspect to reflect when making a decision. Uh, because if you don't know, well, that may give you a warning and you don't risk it. Um, Institution policies, as I mentioned before, educational model of the institution and my capacity to handle certain situations and my awareness of not getting into fields that I'm not a professional at. Going in, uh, being specifically about 
uh, personal issues that may be uh, delicate that touchy to handle with the students. And, and, and it's easy for us just to bring an activity in which they talk about their feelings, but we may not be a psychologist as to be able to handle situations when talking about feelings, right? So just food for thought for everybody to, to be careful in this. I mean, as a suggestion, just to wonder and, and, and to have this question, why do we decide to do something in the classroom? Is it the right reason why I'm deciding to do it or not? Very good. Yeah, so a lot of good deep questions here, I think we brought up today. Um, we didn't I like, go I like we questions didn't... more than answers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I like the question because I would like to have the answer. So I'd like to listen to you guys uh, uh, watching this transmission, giving us your opinions and, and your possible answers. Why not? I mean, it's fair to have an opinion and it's fair to share that opinion uh, uh, as long as you're responsible for what you said right <laughs> yeah and again we really encourage everyone to to, to be a part of the conversation uh, let us know what you think um, we don't expect everyone to agree with what we say and sometimes we don't agree with each other the point here is that we all uh, want to create a space where we uh, you have a voice you can share your ideas and experiences and uh, the point is to learn from each other right that's the point of this podcast is really to build a community around these open uh, discourses, these open conversations, and talking about the issues of the day, talking about things that we face, challenges that we face, successes that we face, uh, uh, and for the sole purpose of learning. And uh, regardless if you're a pre-service English language educator, regardless if you're experienced and have a lot of um, uh, history and, and, and things to share, we encourage you to do so. You can do so by participating in our Facebook page at uh, Teacher Learning Cast. And uh, we're also on Twitter at hashtag TLCELT. And uh, feel free to uh, be a part of the conversation. Again, we're always looking for educators to also participate in our live broadcast. We are here every uh, morning, Saturday morning uh, at 8.15 Central Standard Time. And uh, again, feel free to uh, participate and get involved. Yes, uh, you can go to Benjamin's website, which is benjaminstewart.wordpress.com. You can get to my web uh, site, which is homers2000.weeksite.com uh, slash pdha. And, uh, and you can get to the Facebook fan page, uh, which is at Facebook, Teacher Learning Cast. You can, you can search for it like that. And uh, today we have a long show, but we had a lot of interesting topics and, and, and we can keep on talking about it. But um, I think times has come to pass by like 30 minutes ago. <laughs> So, yeah, I think we'll go ahead and, and conclude. Uh, thanks, Petey, again, uh, for, for your insights and discussions this week. Thanks, everybody, for those of uh, you who watched us live and who are, who's also watching uh, the uh, final broadcast or the recording. And, again, feel free to leave comments in any of the spaces that we mentioned. And uh, we really appreciate your uh, watching the show and uh, being part of the, the community. So thank you very much. And Thank we'll you, everybody. There. Thank you, Ben, for today's talk and questions and answers and whatever we could share. I think uh, today I, I take a lot of things with me to think, reflect, and act. Same here. All right, that'll be all for now. Thanks, everybody. We'll sign out, and we'll see you in the next live broadcast. Right. Thanks for learning. Bye.